Hello coders! Today we're talking about an introduction to ICD-10-CM. So, this is a document that I create every year. I go on CMS.gov. You can also go through the CDC or the National Institutes of Health websites to get the official guidelines. Then what I do is I take those guidelines and I copy and paste them into a Word document, creating two columns. Because if you print out the actual guidelines from CMS, it's about 112 to 120 pages each year. This one I can get down to about 57. So all this information is the same information you're going to find in your ICD-10 codebook. Now, you may have a couple of extra pages, depending on what codebook you're using, that has the specific symbols and the color scheme that your book uses, but we're just going to be talking about the actual guidelines. So the first thing that you need to know, always, our guidelines start October 1st and they end September 30th of the next year. While CPT and HCPCS starts January 1st and goes to December 31st, ICD-10 always starts October 1st and goes until September 30th. So as we look down at this first paragraph, remember there are four organizations that make up our cooperating parties for ICD-10. They make up the American Hospital Association, the AHA, the American Health Information Management Association, or AHIMA, CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and NCHS, um, the National Center of Healthcare Statistics. So those are our four cooperating parties. Remember, this is based off of the World Health Organization. So this comes again from the 1970s. Remember the first edition of ICD-CM in the United States is 1977. So we are now in the 10th revision of the International Classifications of Diseases. The clinical modification is for our diagnosis coding for the United States. So for instance, ICD-10AU is for Australia. ICD-10GE is for Germany. We use CM, and as we go through, I want you to keep in mind that although you can take your skills to other countries, keep in mind that most other countries that use ICD are not using it for reimbursement. They are, you're using it for cataloging because they have socialized medicine. So, as the guidelines tell us, um, Again, the guideline instructions, we also have to uh, fall under HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So again, making sure we're keeping HIPAA compliant because this is patient information. So the first thing that we're going to see here is, is going to describe the importance of documentation. Keep in mind, it is up to the provider to document what they're doing. Or if it's, for instance, an infusion center or a dialysis center, what is the nurse documenting? Okay. Now, all of our guidelines are, are uh, separated into sections. The first section is going to be all the conventions and the general coding guidelines. Then we have chapter specific coding guidelines. Then we have inpatient coding guidelines and outpatient coding guidelines. And we're going to be looking at each and every one of those through all of these videos. So the first thing that we need to know is again, we use the word conventions. Conventions, what it really means is a series of terms and symbols that we use in our code book that give us an understanding of what we're looking at. And so the conventions are going to be in the alphabetic index, where we look up the code, and the tabular list, where we find the code itself. Now it tells us IC10CM is divided into the alphabetic index, which is an alphabetical list of terms and their corresponding codes. And the tabular list is a structured list of codes divided into chapters based on body system or condition. So the alphabetic index is like a dictionary. That's where we're going to look up our information. That's where we can look up things like bronchitis or asthma or GERD. We can look all of those up in the alphabetic index. When we get to the alphabetic index though, it's then going to give us a code. The code is always going to start with a letter and is going to end in numbers and it will always have a period after the third character if there's more than three characters. So the biggest thing that we want to keep in mind is we always look it up in the alphabetic, double check in the tabular. 
but we also have in the alphabetic index uh, the index of diseases and injuries, the index of external causes, the table of neoplasms, and the table of drugs and chemicals. So for ease of coding, we have two main tables we use. Table of drugs and chemicals or anything you can think of that is prescribed, street drugs, um, over-the-counter medications, and anything else that could possibly be ingested by mistake. Think cleaners, um, you know, think uh, different types of uh, substances like gasoline, all of that's in there for the table of drugs and chemicals. The table of neoplasms is for all of our different types of cancers. And the index for disease and injuries is the index to the external causes. So our external causes are V, W, X, and Y codes. These describe what's, you know, how everything happened, what's going on in the situation. Yes, someone fractured their femur, but how did they do it? What activity were they doing while they were doing it? Were they working at the time? And so we have all of this that we're going to find in our book. Now, when it comes to the codes themselves, as it tells us, um, it contains a list of categories, subcategories, and codes. Okay, Characters for categories and subcategories may either be a letter or a number. All categories are three characters. A three-character category has no further subdivisions and is equivalent to a code. So, for instance, code B20 is for someone that has AIDS. That is a three-character code, and that's it. It's a full code. Now, here's the thing. The big difference between ICD-10 codes and HCPCS codes is although they both start with a letter, and tend to end with numbers. The ICD-10 codes, if it has more than three characters, always has a period after the third character. So for instance, you can have uh, B96.2, because again, the point always comes before the third, in between, I should say, the third and fourth character. Now again, the big difference between what we used to use ICD-9 into ICD-10 is codes can now be three, four, five, six, or seven characters. And although the first character is always a capital letter, the second two characters are always numbers. But characters four, five, six, and seven can be letters or numbers, and that's completely dependent on the code section that we're in. One of the big things here is each level of subdivision after a category is a subcategory. The final level of subdivision is a code. So when, when you get to a full code and it's not asking you to add any extra characters onto it, you have now gotten to a code. Now codes that have applicable seventh characters are still referred to as codes, not subcategories. Okay, if we need to go out to seven characters, we have to go all the way out. A code that has an applicable seventh character is considered invalid without the seventh character. Okay, so when we need a seventh character, it will tell us in the tabular that we need it, and then we have to assign the appropriate seventh character. Otherwise, we do not have a code yet, and we are coding. Keep that in mind. We don't want to do a partial code. We will not get reimbursed for it, and it will get rejected. Now, it goes on to tell us, for reporting purposes only, codes are uh, permissible, not categories or subcategories, and any applicable seventh character is required. So again, it's reminding us that we have to get out to the full code. Now, ICD-10-CM utilizes a placeholder, which is character X. The X is used as a placeholder at certain codes to allow for future expansion. An example of this is at the poisoning, adverse effects, and underdosing codes, category T36 to T50. So when we moved from ICD-9 to ICD-10, it took a long time. Just to give you an idea, the, I, the thought that we should be moving as a country from IC9 to IC10 started in the early 1990s. It wasn't until 2015 that we officially switched 
from ICD-9 to ICD-10. So it took a long time to get there. <coughs> Part of the reason it did was because of the expansion of codes. And in that expansion of codes, what they decided to do is they decided to leave room for future expansion. So when they want to expand a code set in the future, it's easy to do. However, the biggest thing that we have to keep in mind is to rid ourselves of X meaning unknown, okay? When we take math, X is used as an unknown in algebra. This is not unknown here. What this is is just a placeholder and they decide to use X since it's one of the few letters they did not use in general in ICD-10, okay? So you'll notice that it's not something that we see too often and so we don't need to worry about it as much. Now it tells us when a placeholder exists the X must be used in order for the code to be considered a valid code. So there's times especially in um, the W codes which describe a lot of different types of accidents it's only a three character code but it tells you you have to get out to the seventh character. So what we have to do in that circumstance is do something like W01.XXXA. The X's have to be in there for it to be a full code, otherwise you will not get reimbursed. So when you see an X, you have to put it in the code. It can be capital or lowercase, but make sure you're following what the code says. Now again, it's reminding us that certain categories have an applicable seventh character. The applicable seventh character is required for all codes within the category or as the note in the tabular list instructs. The seventh character must always be the seventh character in the data field. If a code requires a seven characters, it is not six characters. A placeholder of X must be used to fill the empty characters. And again, you're not going to see this in every section. It's most commonly used in the T, V, W, X, and Y. All right, let's talk about some abbreviations that we're going to see here. So we're going to see two main ones. We're going to see NEC, not elsewhere classifiable. This is the same as an other specified. So an other specified is when we know exactly what the condition is, but there's no specific code for it. Okay, so it's other specified, meaning we can specify it, there's no specific code for it. Versus NOS, not otherwise specified, is the equivalent to unspecified, meaning we don't know enough about it, okay? So again, it's the difference between being able to say that someone is having um, right upper quadrant pain versus they're having chest pain. What chest pain? So chest pain is an NOS, not otherwise specified. It's an unspecified code, okay? Not elsewhere classifiable, again, is a specific diagnosis that does not have a specific code to go with it. And so what will happen is when you get to the tabular list, you'll also see NEC and NOS to let you know. And depending on which code book you're using, it might have a different color scheme to it. So the NECs could be highlighted in yellow and the NOSs could be highlighted in gray. You know, and keep that in mind. Make sure that you're familiar with your code book as well, because there's a lot of color schemes that are really helpful as you're coding. Now, when it comes to punctuation, okay, so we're going to see a lot of brackets. So they tell us that brackets are used in the tabular list to enclose synonyms, alternative wordings, or explanatory phrases. Brackets are used in the alphabetic index to identify manifestation codes. So, Let's break this down. So brackets in the tabular list are going to give us alternative words, synonyms, other ways to explain the condition. Okay, that's what brackets are used for in the tabular. Brackets in the alphabetic list are used to identify manifestation codes. And we're going to talk a little bit more about manifestation codes in a little bit, and I'll come back to this. Now, parentheses are used in both the alphabetic index and the tabular list to enclose supplementary words that may be present or absent in the statement of a disease or procedure without affecting the code number to which it is assigned. Okay, so again, 
this is giving us supplementary words. One of the biggest things that you're going to see is what comes next. The terms within these parentheses are also referred to as non-essential modifiers. Okay, the non-essential modifiers in the alphabetic index of diseases is to apply to subterms following a main term, except when a non-essential modifier and a subentry are mutually exclusive. Okay, so when you're looking up a code in the alphabetic index, the first thing that you're going to see is the main term word, and usually it's bolded of some sort in your book. Okay, indented underneath it are all of the subterms. But sometimes, after the main bolded term, you'll see all of these other terms in parentheses before you see the code. Those are the non-essential modifiers. They don't change the code. What they do is give us alternate words that we can use to describe the condition as well. Now, colons we don't see too, too often. It depends on the edition of the book that you have. Colons are used in the tabular list after an incomplete term, which needs one or more modifiers following the colon to make it assignable to a given category. So, for instance, if let's say there's going to be a code that includes acute sinusitis, acute maxillary sinusitis, acute um, sphenoid sinusitis, what we're going to end up seeing is we'll usually have the word acute sinusitis colon and then we'll have the different parts of the sinus cavities and it's a way of saving some space and it's a way of saving ink although again depending on the edition of the book you have you may see these very very rarely the two editions that i tend to use don't have a lot of colons in them but always know that they're completing terms. So again, whatever comes before the colons and whatever comes under the colons are words that we connect. Now again, when we see codes titled other or other specified, again, these are when for information the medical record provides details for which a specific code does not exist. The other specified. We know what's wrong with the patient, we don't have a specific code for it, okay? Versus the unspecified are for use when information in the medical record is insufficient to assign a more specific code. So again, unspecified means we don't have enough information to assign a specific code. Now, along with this, we also have some notations that we're going to find in the tabular. So, it includes notes, appears immediately under a three-character code title to further define or give examples of the content in that category. So, it gives the inclusion terms. As it tells us, the terms may be synonymous of the code title or in the case of other specified codes, the terms are a list of the various conditions assigned to that code. The inclusion terms are not necessarily exhaustive. So again, it's not going to be every different way that you can state these conditions. It's going to give you a couple of examples of the most common, okay? And it's just telling us this information, this diagnosis is included in these codes. And excludes notes, okay, we have two excludes notes. So this is where we need to be really careful. Exclude one means do not code here. So what, what that means is, is that if you're looking for that code, you are in the wrong spot. So for instance, we have rheumatoid arthritis and we have juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, okay? If you get to rheumatoid arthritis, it's going to say excludes one, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and vice versa because it's one or the other, you can't code them together, and we wanna make sure that people are in the right spot, okay? So the exclude one notes, again, are two things that can't be coded together. The other ones that we see is congenital versus acquired. Now, where we have to be careful is where they have this exception, okay? So the exception to the excludes one definition is the circumstances when the two conditions are unrelated to each other, and this has to be unrelated by the provider's documentation. 
If it is not clear whether the two conditions involving the exclude one note are related or not, query the provider. We always go back and ask questions to the provider. For example, code F45.8, other somatoform disorder has an excludes one note because of sleep-related teeth grinding, G47.63. Because teeth grinding is an inclusion term under F45.8. Only one of these two codes should be assigned for teeth grinding. However, psychogenic dysmenorrhea is also an inclusion term under F45.8, and a patient could have both this condition and a sleep-related teeth grinding. In this case, the two conditions are clearly unrelated to each other, so it would be appropriate to report F45.8 and G47.63 together. Okay, so again, we need to have clarification from the provider in the medical record whether or not they are related. And a lot of times people ask me, well, how do we know? Well, number one, the notations will help guide you. Number two, as you work in a certain area of medicine, whether it's primary care or a specialty or things like that, you will get used to when these kind of codes pop up. But that's why we always use both sections of our book. We always look something up in the alphabetical, double check in the tabular, because although the alphabetical will give you a code, it's maybe not a full code. It could still be a category. The other part is the alphabetic index does not have these notations. We have to go to the tabular to get the notations. Now, excludes two is a not included here. An excludes two note indicates the condition excluded is not part of the condition represented by the code, but a patient may have both conditions at the same time. When excludes to note appears under a code, it is acceptable to use both the code and the excludes code together when appropriate. Again, all based off of documentation. Okay? Now, I told you we we're going to get back to the etiology manifestation codes. Okay? So, they tell us certain conditions have both an underlying etiology and multiple body system manifestations due to the underlying etiology. So this is cause and effect. Etiology is the cause, manifestation is the effect. So for instance, if someone has a thyroid disorder, certain thyroid disorders can affect the pancreas. Okay, and so we could have someone who is a diabetic due to a thyroid condition. So the cause is a thyroid condition, the effect is the diabetes. And so these are paired codes usually that we use together, okay? So for such conditions, the IC10CM is a coding convention that requires the underlying condition to be sequenced first, if applicable, followed by the manifestation, okay? So cause and then effect. Wherever such a combination exists, again, there are some combo codes here, there is a use additional code note at the etiology um, code and a code first note at the manifestation. These instruction notes indicate the proper sequencing order of codes, etiology followed by manifestation. And we're going to talk about these other ones in a minute, but again, if you just think of it, use additional code. So an additional code, additional something that happens afterwards. Okay, so a use additional code note means you're at the right code, but you have to use another code afterwards to fully explain it. A code first note says you got to the code, however, you need to put another code first to fully explain it. Okay, so again, always etiology, then manifestation. Now, as it tells us, in most cases, the manifestation codes will have the code title in diseases classified elsewhere. Okay, codes with this title are a component of the etiology manifestation convention. The code title indicates that it is a manifestation code. In diseases classifiable elsewhere codes are never permitted to be used as a first listed or principal diagnosis code. And that's because they always need to have something first. Okay? Um, they must be used in conjunction with an underlying condition code and they must be listed following the underlying condition. So, so C category F02 dementia and other diseases classifiable elsewhere for an example of this convention. So, let's go to ic10data.com. This is one of my favorite websites. 
And when we get to ICD-10 data, we can look up things in a couple different ways. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go straight to the code categories. So down here, I'm going to go to ICD-10 codes. Then I'm going to go to the F codes. And then I'm going to click on the F02. Now, this website does not have everything that your code book is going to have. It has a lot of great information when you don't have a code book straight in front of you. So when you get to F02, it tells you code first the underlying physiological condition, such as, and again, they're going to put them in alphabetical order. These are the most common causes. These are not all of them. So there can be other ones. So Alzheimer's, of course, dementia with Parkinson's, HIV, Huntington's disease, Jacob Kreutzfeldt disease, which is mad cow disease, um, Pick's disease, a prion disease, vitamin B deficiency, right? So again, we have to code first what was the cause, the effect is the dementia. But we also have a type 2 excludes here. Type 2 excludes tells us dementia, and alcohol, and psychoactive substance disorder, and vascular dementia. So again, in this case, we can code these together. And then there's a regular includes notes, which is giving us major neurocognitive disorder in diseases classified elsewhere. So that's what we're looking for in diseases classified elsewhere. That's where that statement's coming in. And so again, we would never use one of these codes first. It would always be one of these codes or another condition that is causing the dementia. So as we go back to our guidelines, um, it is reminding us, uh, again, as we saw right here, that we also see things like G20, and again, it tells us what can be coded first and what can't. So again, we also have code first and use additional code notes as general sequencing rules, so kind of keep that in mind. It's not always for etiology manifestation codes. Now, this next one. It takes a little while of getting used to, but we just have to get used to it because it is what it is. Sometimes in coding, the answer is because that's what it is, um, because we have to go by the guidelines. These are our rules. So the word and should be interpreted to mean either and or or when it appears in a title. For example, cases of tuberculosis of bones and tuberculosis of joints and tuberculosis of bones and joints are classified as subcategory A18.0, tuberculosis of bones and joints. So again, in this case, it's more combining the terms. We just have to go with it. Again, we don't see it too, too often, but again, we see the word and, it can mean and or or. Now, the word with or in uh, should be interpreted to mean associated with or due to when it appears in a code title, the alphabetic index, or an instructional note in the tabular list. So again, it's associated with, it's due to, it's in another disease. Um, this classification presumes a causal relationship between the two conditions linked by these terms in the alphabetic index or the tabular list. These conditions would, should be coded as related even in the absence of prior documentation explicitly linking them unless the documentation clearly states the conditions are unrelated or when another guideline exists that specifically requires documented linkage between the two conditions. So again, sepsis guideline for acute organist function that is not clearly associated with sepsis. So again, we need to be careful about the with and the ins. Now, for conditions not specifically linked by these relational terms in the classification or when the guideline requires that linkage between two conditions be explicitly documented, provider documentation must link the conditions in order to code them as related. So again, it's always about provider documentation. That is the biggest thing here. Now again, the word with in the alphabetic index um, 
and the word with in the alphabetic index, uh, sorry, the word with in the alphabetic index is sequenced immediately following the main term, not in alphabetical order. So one of the big things that a lot of people get confused with at first is the fact that um, the word with comes first, and that's for ease of coding. So the first thing you're going to see if there is any of our uh, main terms with anything else, you're going to see with as the first subterm, then everything else in alphabetical order. Now, when it comes to C and C also. So again, the C instruction following a main term in the alphabetic index indicates that another term should be referenced. It is necessary to go to that main term reference with a C note to locate the correct code. C is telling you you have to go somewhere else, okay? You're not going to find the code there, and we have to go somewhere else. So, um, the C also instruction is following a main term in the alphabetic index instructs that there is another main term that may be referenced. So again, it is not necessary to follow the C also note when the original main term provides the necessary codes. So, the biggest thing now is uh, keeping in mind that the C note is you have to go somewhere else. C also is here somewhere else you could look. So C is a you must go there. C also is you can go there if you would like. Now, as we were talking about earlier, the code also note again tells us that we need two codes. So here's the biggest thing about code also. This note does not provide sequencing direction. The sequencing depends on the circumstance of the encounter. Sequencing is what order do we put the codes in. And in general, our guidelines are going to tell us what sequence certain codes need to be in. However, there are other notations such as code first and use additional that tell us exactly where that code needs to be. The code also note is just saying you also need to use another code. But again, a lot of it depends on the circumstances. So this is why, again, we're going through the conventions, and then we're going to go through the outpatient guidelines, and then we're going to go through separate ones. So, you know, again, the other uh, videos will be chapter-specific guidelines, which break down the guidelines for each and every section of the codebook as well. So again, these are general conventions. These go for the entire codebook. Now, this is what I was saying earlier. A uh, code listed next to a main term in ICD-10 in the alphabetic index is referred to as the default code. Sometimes we also call that the main term. It's also usually a bolded term. Um, and the default code represents the condition that is most commonly associated with the main term or is the unspecified code for the condition. So let's go back here for a minute. Let's go back to our ICD-10 data. And this time, I'm going to go to its main website. And instead of looking directly at the codes, we are going to look at the index that they have. So you go down here to IC10 index, we're going to look up the word pneumonia. So we have P. Let's see. All right, so we're getting there. So, okay, so pneumonia is the main term here. Okay, now again, pneumonia is our main term. All of these terms, acute, double, migratory, purulent, septic, and unresolved, these are all the non-essential modifiers. These do not change this code right here. J18.9 is the unspecified pneumonia. But if the doctor says acute pneumonia, migratory pneumonia, septic pneumonia, purulent pneumonia, it's all J18.9. Okay, these are all what we call essential modifiers underneath because they are subterms. Okay, and you'll see they have different codes with them. All right, so that's what they mean by these default codes. Now, the biggest thing here is the assignment of a diagnosis code is based on the provider's diagnostic statement that a condition exists. 
the provider's statement that the patient has a particular condition is sufficient. Code assignment is not based on clinical criteria used by the provider to establish the diagnoses. So for instance, we have coma scales, okay? And there are specific pieces of clinical criteria that doctors use to decide where a patient is in the coma scales. But we do not use that, that paperwork. We do not use that clinical criteria. We use the provider's diagnostic statements, okay? So that's the biggest thing to keep in mind. We're always going back to the medical record, to the provider's statements. Now, as we've talked about, again, we're going to look things up in the alphabetical and double check in the tabular. Now, the second paragraph here tells us, it is essential to use both the alphabetic index and the tabular list when locating and assigning a code. The alphabetic index does not always provide the full code. Selection of the full code includes laterality and any applicable seventh character that can only be done in the tabular list. A dash at the end of an alphabetic entry indicates that an additional character are required. Even if the dash is not included at the alphabetic index entry, it is necessary to refer to the tabular list to verify that there are no seventh characters required. So two things. Number one, the majority of the IC10 codebooks do use a dash. Some of them will use like a checkbox or something like that. So you always want to go through again your specific IC10 codebook to look at the different types of symbols they use. Okay? But again, even if there is no dash after the code, always double check the tabular because the tabular is where all of our notations are. And we won't know if we're necessarily in the right place until we double check the code in the tabular. Now, as we've said before, our codes can be three, four, five, six, or seven characters. But if it has more than three characters, the period always comes after the third character. So if you look right here, A00.0, T88.9, Z99.8, okay? So if we need more than three characters to fully explain a code, we need to make sure we get that period in there because that's what differentiates diagnosis codes from HICPICS and procedure codes. Now, the codes that we can use for diagnoses are A00 through T88.9 and Z00 to Z99.8. And these identify diagnoses, symptoms, conditions, problems, complaints, and other reasons for the encounter or visit. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about signs and symptoms. So codes that describe symptoms and signs as opposed to diagnoses are acceptable for reporting purposes when a related definitive diagnosis has not been established or confirmed by the provider. So symptoms are what people can feel. They feel hot. They feel cold. They, um, you know, they uh, feel heat coming off a part of their body. Okay. Versus signs are things we can see. We can see a rash, we can see redness, we can see a cut, we can see a bruise. So again, signs and symptoms versus an established diagnosis. So here's the thing, some conditions require testing and sometimes they require multiple testing to make sure we have the correct condition. So there are acceptable times when we can code for signs and symptoms as opposed to the diagnoses. If a patient comes in and they have a cough and, and they have a lot of mucus production, they could have bronchitis or they could have pneumonia. Now, if the doctor does not know, we cannot code maybe pneumonia, maybe bronchitis, but we can code the signs and symptoms. We can code the mucus congestion and we can code excuse me, um, and we can code uh, the cough and things like that. But Let's say the doctor then sends the patient to radiology for a chest x-ray. Well, when the patient gets there, the radiology request form is going to say cough and mucus congestion. But if the radiologist says, no, this is definitely pneumonia, then the radiology coder codes the diagnosis of pneumonia because it has been confirmed. 
Okay, so that's the big thing. These maybe, probably, possibly's, we don't use that in the outpatient setting. So although there are some codes that describe the probably maybes, they're for the inpatient setting. In the outpatient setting, we always code signs and symptoms instead of a maybe or probably diagnosis. However, Signs and symptoms that are associated routinely with the disease process should not be assigned as an additional code unless otherwise instructed by the classification. So for instance, um, if someone uh, has a cough with their asthma, those are things that are connected. Most people have asthma will have a cough from time to time. So we do not include the cough because the cough is part of having asthma just like we would not code high blood sugar for a diabetic. Okay, they are part of the same condition. Now again, additional signs and symptoms that may not be associated routinely with the disease process should be coded when present. So the big thing here is again, is it connected or not? And again, this is where documentation from the provider comes in. And this is when we have to go back and query the provider, ask them if these conditions are connected or not. Okay. Now, they tell us there are multiple coding for a single condition. We've already seen one again. In addition to the etiology manifestation, which we've talked about, um, there are other single conditions that also require more than one code. The used additional code notes found in the tabular list at codes that are not part of an etiology manifestation pair where a secondary code is useful to fully describe a condition. The sequencing rule is the same as the etiology manifestation pair. Used additional code indicates that a secondary code should be added if known. So let's look at the example. For example, for bacterial infections that are not included in Chapter 1, a secondary code from Category B95, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, and Enterococcus as the cause of uh, diseases classifiable elsewhere, or B96, other bacterial agents as the cause of disease classified elsewhere, may be required to identify the bacterial organism causing the infection. A use additional code note will normally be found at the infection disease code indicating the need for an organism code to be added as a secondary code. Okay, so let's look at these. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to our tabular. So one of the biggest areas we see this is going to be respiratory conditions. Now, some respiratory conditions are going to have the infectious agent included in it, okay? So right here, acute sinusitis. This one does not use additional code B95 to B97 to identify infectious agents. So what's causing the acute sinusitis, okay? So that's what we need to know. So we have all these different types of acute sinusitis, but what's the cause? So the first code is going to be the acute sinusitis. The secondary code is going to be from the B95 to B97, which are our Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Enterococcus, and bacterial and viral agents. So again, we want to be careful. We want to follow what the book tells us to do. Now, again, code first notes are also under certain codes, but are not specifically manifestation codes. It may be due to an underlying cause. So when there is a code first note and an underlying condition is present, the underlying condition should be sequenced first if known. You'll notice that there's a lot of if known, and that's because a lot of conditions that we have in this book, it takes a long time through testing and process of elimination to know what a patient has. And so it's not always as easy as we do one test and we know exactly what's wrong with the patient. And so that's something we want to kind of keep in mind. So these notations, again, are always going to be in the tabular, and that's why it is so important to make sure we're always going from the alphabetic to the tabular index. 
Now, code if applicable, any causal condition first. Notes uh, indicates that this code may be assigned as a principal diagnosis when the causal condition is unknown or not applicable. So again, causal condition, what is the cause? So cause and effect. Um, if the causal condition is known, then the code for the condition should be sequenced as the principal or first list of diagnosis. However, it goes on to tell us multiple codes may be needed for a sequel A, complication codes, or obstetric codes to more fully describe a condition. See specific guidelines for these conditions for further instructions. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Now, because we have a lot of infections, the biggest thing to keep in mind is we're going to have acute and we're going to have a chronic for a lot of our infection codes. So if the same condition is described as both acute, subacute, and chronic and separate subentries exist at the alphabetic index at the same indentation level, code both and sequence the acute or subacute first. So again, acute always comes before chronic, no matter what. Now, a combination code is a single code used to classify either two diagnoses or a diagnosis with an associated secondary process like a manifestation or a diagnosis with an associated complication. Combination codes are identified by referring to the subterm entry in the alphabetic index and by reading the inclusions and exclusion notes in the tabular list. So again, we're always on the lookout for combination codes. Now, it's going to take you a bit of time to start getting used to which areas have a lot of combination codes and which ones do not. But that is also why we play around with the code book. Because the more that you're used to looking up information and double checking it, the easier that it is for you to be able to understand these uh, conventions and then the guidelines. Now, we assign only the combination code when that code fully identifies the diagnostic condition involved or when the alphabetic index so directs. Multiple coding should not be used when the classification provides a combination code that clearly identifies all of the elements documented in the diagnosis. When the combination code lacks necessary specificity in describing the manifestation or complication, an additional code should be used as a secondary code. So one of the first things you always want to ask yourself once you start looking for a diagnosis is, does the code I found have all the information I'm looking for? If it does, then you're good. If it doesn't, do we need to add another code? So again, combination codes a lot of times have two aspects of a diagnosis, like the inflammation with the infectious agent combined into one code. Other codes, we will need more than one code to fully describe the condition. The more you code, the more you get used to what uh, areas are going to use one code, two codes, or more. Now, SQL A, which used to be known as late effects. So, a SQL A is the residual effect after the acute phase of illness or injury has terminated. What does that mean? So a sequel A is a current condition that was produced by a previous condition, illness or injury, that is over and done with. So for instance, if someone fractures their knee and then 15 years later, the doctor says, you have arthritis in your knee because of the fracture that you had 15 years ago. That's a sequel A. The arthritis is the current condition. The cause is the previous fracture, okay? And here's the big thing. As it tells us, there is no time limit on when a sequel A code can be used. The residual may be apparent early, such as a cerebral infarction, so a stroke, or it may occur months or years later, such as that due to a previous injury, such as a fracture of the kneecap. So again, other examples include scar formation resulting from a burn, okay, deviated septum due to a nasal fracture, infertility due to tubal occlusion from old tuberculosis. So again, it's a current problem caused by a previous problem that are over and done with. But again, sequencing. 
Coding with a SQL A generally requires two codes sequenced in the following order. Uh, the condition or nature of the SQL A is conditioned first, and the SQL A code is, is sequenced second. And when we look these up in the book, again, the, the first code is going to be whatever the current condition is, whatever that might be. The second code we're going to look under SQL A, and then we're going to look under the type of accident, injury, or diagnosis that was the original problem that eventually, through time, caused the current condition. But keep in mind, a SQL A is a condition that is over and done with that has caused a new problem. Okay, so if the person is still having problems from that original injury, that is not a SQL A anymore. Okay, now the exception to the above guidelines are those instances where the code for the SQL A is followed by a manifestation code identified in the tabular list and title, or the SQL A code has been expanded at the fourth, fifth, or sixth character levels to include the manifestations. The code for the acute phase of illness or injury that has led to the SQL A is never used with a code for the late effect. Again, because when we were talking about those seventh characters earlier, part of what our seventh characters do for certain accidents and injuries is it tells us what's going on with that accident or injury. So we can identify whether this is an acute phase of illness, they're still healing, whether there's a problem with healing, or if it is in fact a sequel a so again we do not it's not one or the other okay so again if it's a sequel a we never code the acute phase of illness we code the illness with an s for sequel a if it has a seventh character s to it so we have to be careful again what's the current condition What's the previous condition? And the previous condition will always be the sequel. Now, number 11 here, this is only for the inpatient setting. So you're talking about hospitals, nursing homes, psychiatric facilities. So, code any condition described at the time of discharge as impending or threatened as follows. If it did occur, code it as a confirmed diagnosis. Okay, so if they said impending stroke and the patient had a stroke, we code it as a stroke. But if it did not occur, reference the alphabetic entry to determine if the condition has a sub-entry for impending or threatened, and also reference main term entries for impending or threatened. So again, you can look under stroke, impending, stroke, threatened, or impending stroke, threatened stroke. So again, you can use either of them as main terms. If the subterms are listed, assign the given code. If the subterms are not listed, code the existing underlying conditions and not the condition described as impending or threatened. Okay, so again, we don't have a lot of these, and this is only on the inpatient side. How do we know it's inpatient? Because of this term, discharge. We only use the term discharge when we are talking about the inpatient setting. Okay? Number 12, each unique ICD-10 CM diagnosis code may be reported only once for the encounter. This applies to bilateral conditions when there are no distinct codes identifying laterality or two different conditions classified to the same ICD-10 CM diagnosis code. So we can only use the same code once per person, no matter what reason, okay? So for instance, some of our glaucomas don't have a right eye or left eye differentiation. We cannot use the same code twice. We would not do that. We use the code once, and that describes the laterality of it, even though the code itself does not say bilateral, okay? So we need to be careful about that. So if you use the same code more than once, it's automatically wrong. Now, some IC10 codes indicate laterality right and left side, specifying whether the condition occurred on the left, right, or bilateral. If no bilateral code is provided and the condition is bilateral, assign separate codes for both left and right side. If the side is not identified in the medical record, assign the code for the unspecified side. 
So again, for instance, a lot of our accents and injury codes have a left and a right, but they don't have a bilateral because it's rare that you get the same exact injuries in the same exact places on both sides, especially with fractures. You could fracture both your right and left femur, but the fractures might be different parts of the femur, which means they're different codes. Okay, so we need to be really careful about that. Now, when a patient has a bilateral condition, each side is treated during separate encounters. Assign the bilateral code as the condition still exists on both sides, um, including for the encounters to treat the first side. For the second encounter for treatment after one side has been previously treated and the condition no longer exists on that side, assign the appropriate unilateral code for which the condition still exists. Okay? So, for instance, when they do cataract surgery, they tend to do them spaced a week apart. Okay? So, if let's say John goes on Tuesday of this week to get his right eye cataract surgery, when he shows up, if he has bilateral cataracts, we're going to code for bilateral cataracts, okay? But when John comes back next Tuesday and he does his left eye, we're only going to code the cataract of the left eye. The right eye doesn't exist anymore. We have previously treated it. As it goes on, if the treatment on the first side did not completely resolve the condition, then the bilateral code would still be appropriate. But if we fully treated the site, we're not going to use the diagnosis code anymore because they don't have that diagnosis anymore. Okay? So again, it's all situational. Now it goes on to tell us for the body mass index, depth of non pressure chronic ulcers, pressure ulcer stage, coma scale, and NIH stroke scale, which is NIHSS. Code assignment may be based on a medical record documentation from clinicians who are not the patient's provider, i.e. physician or other qualified health care professionals legally accountable for establishing the patient's diagnosis. So again, a dietitian often documents BMI, a nurse and often documents pressure ulcer stages, an emergency medical technician often documents the coma scale. However, the associated diagnosis, such as overweight, obesity, acute stroke, a pressure ulcer, must be documented by the patient's provider. Okay? If there are conflicting medical record documentation, either from the clinician or different clinicians, the patient's attending provider should be queried for clarification. So again, this could be for the inpatient or the outpatient side. Um, you know, again, we want to be careful. If information is not matching up, we need to go back to the providers to make sure that we have the appropriate diagnosis code because we don't want to bill out a diagnosis code that does not exist for that patient. Yes, we can rebill it, but a lot of times when we rebill it, that information stays on the patient's account and it can harm their ability to get certain insurances in the future, such as life insurance, because they've had the wrong code assigned to them before. Okay, now it goes on though, the BMI, coma scale, and NIHSS code should only be reported as secondary diagnosis. So again, they're just giving additional information about the condition. Now for syndromes, follow the alphabetic index guidance when coding syndromes. In the absence of an alphabetic index guidance, assign codes for the documented manifestations of the syndrome. Additional codes for manifestations are not integral to the disease process, may also be assigned when the condition does not have a unique code. So for instance, the Q codes, which are um, congenital anomalies. Congenital anomalies are anything that could possibly go wrong in utero that then someone is born with. And so what we have to be careful about is there are a lot of syndromes out there that are very rare. And so they do not have a unique code that goes with them. So what we do instead is we code all the signs and symptoms, what is known about the disease. There's other things where we plain just don't know what the disease is. It's something completely new or it's a new offshoot of a disease that doesn't have a code for it yet. So, you know, keep in mind, you know, syndromes tend to be a group of signs and symptoms that altogether show a very specific condition. 
okay? Um, and so we want to kind of keep that in mind. Syndromes are different. Now, for the documentation of complication of care, okay? Code assignment is based on the provider's documentation of the relationship between the condition and the care or procedure unless otherwise instructed by the classification. This guideline extends to any complication of care regardless of the chapter the code is located in. It is important to note that not all conditions occur during or following medical or surgical care classified as complications. There must be a cause and effect relationship between the care provided and the condition and an indication in the documentation that it is a complication. Query the provider for, for clarification if the complication is not clearly documented. So, for instance, if someone has their gallbladder taken out and four days later, they're still in pain, we know that. That's something that we know about those types of surgeries. But if, let's say, now it's been three weeks since their surgery and they're still in extreme pain, that's a little bit different. That has now become a complication. How do we know it's a complication? Because the surgeon or the other provider that's seeing the patient will have to tell us that it's a complication. And maybe it'll be more specific. Maybe it's not just pain. Maybe it's an infection. And so, again, they have to have a cause and effect relationship between the surgery and the infection or between the condition and the complication. Always, always documentation. Now, if the provider documents a borderline diagnosis at the time of discharge, the diagnosis is coded as confirmed unless the classification provides a specific entry like borderline diabetes. So again, we don't have a lot of borderline diagnosis codes. We do have a couple of them. If there's one, use that code. If a borderline condition has a specific index entry in ICD-10, it should be coded as such. Since borderline conditions are not uncertain diagnoses, no distinction is made between the care setting inpatient versus outpatient, so it doesn't matter where they are. Whenever the documentation is unclear regarding a borderline condition, coders are encouraged to query for clarification. Again, you know, sometimes the doctors like to use the terms borderline, but are they using it properly? One of the other big things you're going to notice in the ICD-10 book is that there are certain sections where they repeat important information. So I'm not going to reread through the use of signs, symptoms, and unspecified codes since we talked about them already, but this is just a restatement and a further clarification of why we use sign, symptom, and unspecified codes. It's because there are times where we don't have enough information and we have to use these codes. And always keep that in mind. If you see information more than once, it's because it's very, very important. Now, I'm going to skip by all of the chapter-specific coding guidelines, okay? And I'm going to go all the way Oh, where is it? down here. So it will say Section 4, Diagnostic Coding and Reporting Guidelines for Outpatient Services. So this is almost at the end of your guidelines section, um, and this is for the outpatient guidelines. So again, it goes in to tell us these have been approved by outpatient hospitals and providers. Again, as it tells us, Guidelines in Section 1, Conventions, General Coding Guidelines, and Chapter-Specific Guidelines should also be applied for outpatient services and office visits. Now, this is also important to keep in mind. The terms encounter and visit are all often used interchangeably in describing outpatient service contacts. Therefore, they appear together in these guidelines without distinguishing one for the other. So encounter and visit is your face-to-face -face with a provider of some sort. Now, again, we use the term first listed condition to best describe what goes first for our outpatient coding. Um, again, the inpatient uses principal diagnosis. Now, in determining the first listed diagnosis, uh, the coding conventions of ICD-10-CM as well as the general and disease-specific guidelines take precedence over outpatient guidelines. So, 
The conventions are the basis of what you need to know to be able to use the book. These guidelines that we're reading through are the basis for how we code for outpatient services in general. Chapter specific guidelines trump all of these. So if a chapter specific guideline says something different than what it says here, go with the chapter specific guideline, okay? So it reminds us that diagnoses are often not established at the time of the initial encounter or visit. It may take two or more visits before a diagnosis is confirmed. The most critical rule involves beginning the search for the correct code assignment through the alphabetic index. Never begin searching initially in the tabular list as this will lead to coding errors. Always start with the alphabetical. So now we're gonna go through some specifics about certain scenarios the patient might be in. So when the patient presents for outpatient surgery or same day surgery, code the reason for the surgery as the first listed diagnosis or a reason for the encounter even if the surgery is not performed due to a contraindication. So even what we think of as silly and simple little things means a patient can't get surgery. So if Bob has a cold and he goes in for his colonoscopy, guess what? Nine times out of 10, Bob's gonna be sent home and has to reschedule. So we still have to code the reason why the surgery wasn't done. And again, we would code to describe Maybe it's a screening colonoscopy and that he was sick and that's why we did not perform that surgery. Now again, observation. <clears throat> observation means you're being held in the hospital, but you're not an emergency room patient and you're not an inpatient. What observation really means is we are observing the patient for a period of time at a greater intensity than we would do in the emergency department for a specific reason. So again, if someone hits their head, we might be looking out for a concussion. If um, somebody is having trouble breathing, we might give them some breathing treatments and then see how they're doing. If someone is um, in excruciating pain because of a laceration, uh, you know, again, what happens after we suture it up. So, when a patient is admitted for observation for a medical condition, assign a code for the medical condition as the first listed diagnosis. Okay, so again, why are they being admitted to observation? Now, when a patient presents for outpatient surgery and develops complications requiring an admission to observation, Code the reason for the surgery as the first reported diagnosis, followed by codes for the complication as the secondary diagnosis. So for instance, if someone comes in for a screening colonoscopy and after they wake up, they're starting to kind of move and sit up and get out of bed and they realize there is a pool of blood underneath them, they might be put in observation to try to figure out where is that bleed coming from, especially if the patient didn't bleed during the procedure. So again, regardless, the reason for the surgery goes first because that was the original reason why they came to the facility. And then the reason why they were admitted to observation comes second. Again, it reminds us A00.0 .0 through T88.9 and Z00 to Z99 um, are codes we can use for first listed diagnoses. Again, the big thing for accurate reporting of ICD-10 CM diagnosis codes, the documentation should describe the patient's condition using terminology which includes specific diagnoses as well as symptoms, problems or reasons for the encounters, okay? So again, why are they there? What's the reason? Again, codes that describe symptoms and signs as opposed to diagnoses are acceptable for reporting purposes when a diagnosis has not been established or confirmed by a provider. Again, some of these are directory statements from earlier, so they're letting you know these are important. Keep these in mind. Now, Along with all of these accidents, injuries, infections, we also have a whole series of codes that deal with things that are other than a disease or injury. So the factors influencing health status and contact with health service codes, normally just known as Z codes, are provided 
to deal with occasions when the circumstances other than disease or injuries are recorded as a diagnosis or problem. So yearly physicals are Z codes, screening tests are Z codes, um, counseling is Z codes, you know, uh, statuses, if we want to say that someone has HIV in their body but has not been sick with HIV, that's a Z code. So again, keep that in mind. So we have a whole list of diagnosis codes plus all those Z codes for when someone is not sick but they're still having a healthcare encounter. Again, it reminds us that we can have codes that are three, four, five, six, or seven characters. And if we need to go out to the seventh character, then we must code everything out to the seventh character. Again, list first the ICN code for the diagnosis, condition, problem, or other reason for the encounter shown in the medical record to be chiefly responsible for the services provided. List additional codes that describe any coexisting conditions. In some cases, the first list of diagnosis may be a symptom when a diagnosis has not been established or confirmed by the physician. So again, if we know the reason why the patient's here, that goes first. However, if we have not confirmed the diagnoses by the end of the visit, signs and symptoms may be used. So we always want to ask ourselves, why is the patient here? Why are they here right now? And then is there a guideline about that? It again reminds us we do not code diagnosis documented as probable, suspected, questionable, rule out, or working diagnosis, or other similar terms indicating uncertainty. Rather, code for the conditions to the highest degree of certainty for that encounter, such as symptoms, signs, abnormal test results, or other reasons for the visit. Again, this is different from our inpatient. Keep that in mind. Now, chronic diseases treated on an ongoing basis may be coded and reported as many times as a patient receives treatment and care for the conditions. Okay? Um, so that's the big thing. We always code anything that we are dealing with during this visit. So that goes into the next one. Code all documented conditions that coexist at the time of the encounter and require or affect patient care, treatment, or management. Do not code conditions that were previously treated and no longer exist. However, we have history codes, Z80 to Z87, which may be used as secondary codes if the historical condition or family history has an impact on current care or influences treatment. Now for diagnostic services, so for patients receiving diagnostic services only during an encounter, sequence first the diagnosis, condition, problem, or other reason for the encounter shown in the medical record to be chiefly responsible for the outpatient services provided during that encounter. Code for other diagnoses may be sequenced as an additional diagnosis. So again, a diagnostic service could be an x-ray, it could be a lab, it could be a urinalysis, lots of different ways that we might see uh, these conditions. Now, again, for encounters for routine laboratory radiology testing in the absence of signs, symptoms, or other diagnoses, assign Z01.89 and count for other specified special examinations. So for instance, if someone's going for a pre-employment physical and they're required to get a chest x-ray just to make sure everything is fine, that would fall under Z01.89. Now, for outpatient encounters for diagnostic tests that have been interpreted by a physician and the final report is available at the time of coding, code any confirmed or definitive diagnosis documented uh, in the interpretation. Do not code related signs and symptoms as additional diagnoses. Again, this is different from the hospital and patient because we are talking about the outpatient guidelines. Okay, tells us for patients receiving therapeutic services only during the encounter, sequence first the diagnosis, condition, problem or other reason for the encounter shown in the medical record to be chiefly responsible for the outpatient services provided during that encounter or visit. Code for other diagnoses like chronic conditions may be sequenced as additional diagnoses. Again, 
The only exception to this rule is when the primary reason for the admission is for something like chemotherapy or radiation therapy. In this case, the appropriate Z code for the service is listed first and the diagnosis or problem for which the service is being performed is listed second. All right, now preoperative evaluations. So for patients receiving preoperative evaluations only, sequence first a code from subcategory Z01.81 and counter for pre-procedural examinations to describe the pre-op consultations. Assign a code for the condition to describe the reason for surgery as an additional diagnosis. Code also any findings related to the pre-op evaluation. So again, we always code after the patient's left. So, um, the big thing that we need to kind of keep in mind is what do we know when the patient has a left? So what does the doctor find during that visit? Now, for ambulatory surgery, day surgery, code the diagnosis for which the surgery was performed. If the postoperative diagnosis is different from the preoperative diagnosis at the time the diagnosis is confirmed, select the postoperative diagnosis for coding since it's the most definitive. So again, before surgery, we might have an idea of what the patient has, but after surgery, we might know exactly. So if anything changes, that's when we are going to make sure that we are only coding from the postoperative diagnosis. Now, if we have any abnormal findings, the subcategories for counters with general medical examinations, which are Z00.0, provide codes for which, uh, for with and without abnormal findings. Should a general medical examination result in abnormal findings, the code for general medical examination with abnormal findings should be assigned as the first listed diagnosis. So for instance, if um, they are doing a yearly exam on a woman and they find a lump in her breast, that is a normal finding. We want to code it as abnormal. Now, an examination with abnormal findings refers to a condition or diagnosis that is newly identified or change in severity of a chronic condition, such as uncontrolled hypertension or an acute exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease during a routine female examination. Um, a secondary code for the abnormal finding should also be coded. So again, what do we know? What's the abnormal finding? Now, again, account for routine health screenings. Go back to our Z codes again. So the biggest thing here is keep in mind, we have our coding conventions, which include symbols and terms that we use to describe how to use the code book. Then, we just went through the outpatient general coding guidelines, okay? Keep in mind that all this builds upon each other. The conventions and symbols come first, then our general coding guidelines, then our chapter specific guidelines. So you wanna keep all of this in mind as you start to look at all the different videos and include all the different chapter specific guidelines. Good luck, guys.